Okay, this is the first lecture of McGurr's A Fierce Discontent. And I will start by sharing my screen. I'll go through um, McGurr's book here. Oops. Two, sorry. Okay, so a little bit about our uh, author. He is uh, from, got his PhD at Yale University. 1984. Now Indiana University's political historian uh, of the United States is interested in power, ideology, and culture. Uh, so this book is about um, how the progressive era and the progressives, uh, how their actions are manifested in uh, political response uh, and the things that uh, politics is able to achieve. Right. So You need to start with a little bit of uh, uh, idea about the progressives. Right? As I suggested on uh, last week or on Tuesday, that one of the things about the progressives is that they're, they have so many different things going on that it's really hard to nail down exactly who and what progressives are. Uh, so what you can do, or what we can do, is think about the progressives and sort of unify them under the idea that they're a, a reform movement and that they're looking to change other people, right? So this is not a self-reform movement. This is not about uh, self-actualization, you know, living your best life. This is about um, making the nation better and safer by prompting other people to change, right? So wanting to remake the nation. And the, the place they look and find uh, who are the best people to be emulating, they find themselves uh, in the mirror and they suggest that other people have to change and act like them. And so for thinking about how to put together uh, what would be, I guess, a, a thumbnail sketch of who a progressive is, right? So um, it's not absolute, one size does not fit all, but this is a, a good way of thinking about who the progressives are. So first, they're white. Uh, they're white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, to be a little bit more specific. Um, they're, uh, they consider themselves the old stock of the United States, and uh, they are and consider themselves the descendants of the founders of the nation. So they believe they know uh, what was intended by the founding fathers and how to continue these things. So um, they, as a class, they tend to be middle class and lower upper class. So they're a segment of the populace um, who are doing relatively well. So, and we'll talk about these different class formations uh, in, in a little bit. Um, they're also urban. This is an urban-based reform movement. There was a previous uh, rural-based reform movement that did not achieve its goals. That was the populace. And I'm going to talk about them a little bit in the 1896 election. Um, these progressive, this is an urban-based reform movement. They also tend to be uh, people who have uh, some college education, right, which makes them well outside the mainstream here. So if we had to create a thumbnail sketch of who a progressive is, it's a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, who uh, lives in cities or larger towns. Um, they are uh, from the middle uh, class or lower upper class, so they're doing relatively well, um, and they uh, tend to be college educated. So these progressives, they're a, a subset of the nation's populace. And they're promoting this idea about reforming other people and the way they think people should reform, and we're gonna talk about what groups they target, um, are to be more like themselves, more like the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant middle class. And so McGurr says, you know, it's really difficult because under the banner of progressive or the progressivist uh, movement is that there's a lot of different ideas of reform, what should be reformed, uh, who should be reforming, how they should be reforming. Um, so it's really difficult to, to nail down. The banner itself is quite large, the umbrella is quite large, and a lot of people who have ideas about things that should be changed fit under it. But McGurr says you, you can uh, center, this book is centered around, and he believes you can center around uh, four types of battles that the progressives are fighting. Uh, first is that they're going to change other people. Other people need to alter what they're doing uh, because they see it as detrimental or, uh, or uh, un-American, right? So changing other people to act in ways that they think is the proper way to do things. 
which is going to be at both ends of, as we shall see, the uh, class scale or economic scale. So changing other people, that's a key battle that the, the progressives are fighting here. Uh, they want to end class conflict. So I've mentioned classes, but the progressives reject this idea of class formation and class identity because they say this is not what the founding fathers set up. The founding fathers set up uh, individual uh, pursuit of happiness and success, uh, not a class-based uh, movement. It's, a, it's an individual movement. And so uh, what the progressives see is that this nation uh, at the turn of the 20th century is increasingly riven by class conflict between, um, at the top, uh, folks called the upper 10, who I'll talk about in a bit, uh, and at the bottom of the economic scale, the, the much larger, vast laboring class or working class, right? Um, these, uh, this conflict between the ownership class and the labor class is, uh, is uh, increasing and ratcheting up in violence and intensity and also in uh, volume. There's more and more uh, uh, radical and violent event, events between uh, laborers and owners, right? So this class conflict is something that the progressives see as tearing the nation apart, and they want to stop it or end it. This is not how they set out. This is not a battle that they took from the outset, the progressives, but they come to recognize that at the root of many of the problems that they see plaguing this nation that need to be addressed, that behind them are uh, things that are directed by big business. That big business controls far too much of uh, the nation uh, and that the interests of big, uh, of big businesses are in opposition what's in the best interest of the nation. And so what the progressives come to see, again, they don't start off with this you know, battle, we're gonna control big business, is a recognition that at the root of many of the problems are economic issues, economic issues that are driven by big business interests acting in their own interests, not in the interest of the workers or larger society. And fourth, a battle uh, uh, that is out of step with the rhetoric that the, the progressives are uh, drawing upon. The progressives are drawing upon the rhetoric they see as the American Revolution. So they uh, say the founding fathers created this nation for all to succeed, right? The, the language is um, the pursuit of happiness. All men are created equal, right? So the idea that we all have access to these rights as uh, part of the rhetoric of the formation of the nation, uh, a notion that is further reinforced by the constitutional amendments, which we talked about for Reconstruction, most importantly, the 14th Amendment, in which uh, everyone is guaranteed equal citizenship rights, regardless of uh, race, creed, or color, right? So um, counter to that narrative, that rhetoric that the, the progressives are promoting is the idea that they favor segregating society. This is the post-reconstruction period where the, uh, the rights of um, the black population in particular, but also to a certain degree, the Native American population are being restricted and extracted from them under Jim Crow, right? This is a process of reversing what Reconstruction did to create equal equality in the eyes of the law, uh, creating a Jim Crow system uh, in which there are segregated, uh, groups are segregated based upon their race uh, into different categories in which at the top is the white ruling party and below that is segregated out or separated uh, uh, the black and other uh, ethnic minority population. This is counter to what the progressives are promoting as what the founding fathers intended, but they're suggesting that the black population in particular, uh, but minority populations in general, accept this segregation to keep the peace because they know it's not exactly in step with the Founding Fathers, but they suggest for their own protection that they need to accept this segregation. It's a very paternalistic notion of the progressives, right? That we know what's best for you. You're right that the, the white Southern population who is oppressing you um, and uh, you know, forcing you into this lower tier status, uh, it's separated from the white population. This is not what the Founding Fathers intended, but the, the progressives fear that this conflict between the races is tearing the nation apart. And so to end this conflict in the short term, 
I suppose in, the, in their long-term vision, things will be uh, worked out. But in the short term, the black population or minority populations should accept this segregation. So this is one of the battles that they uh, put their shoulder to because they're afraid of disorder and chaos. This is what the, the progressives are afraid of. And the progressive movement, oh, sorry, it's, uh, it's very interesting because uh, it, it, it's a movement that reaches its apex um, during the uh, American involvement of World War I and then just as suddenly ends. So it's, it's a very um, um, defined period of time. So we begin with uh, 1900. Uh, there's really nobody who would officially call themselves a progressive prior to 1900. That term did not exist as a political term. By 1912, there are four candidates for the presidency. Uh, all four candidates are claiming the mantle of progressivism. So we've gone from nobody being a progressive to 1912. Everybody wants to be a progressive in order to win the election. Um, and during World War I, the progressives have their greatest impact, the greatest um, effect on the nation's life. Uh, and then just as quickly as they reached their apex in 1920, the progressives and progressive ideas and the progressive movement is firmly rejected in the election of 1920. And so as a formalized movement, the progressive movement begins to fall apart after 1920, right? As we shall see, um, the ideas and the ideals of the progressive movement um, don't disappear. And in fact, they don't begin uh, de novo in 1900. Many of the ideas that the progressives are promoting are things that the populists had been promoting. And so it's part of this sort of larger, you know, swing in American life of uh, conservative and liberal or uh, reform and maintenance uh, uh, patterns in American history. So um, the progressive era is a reform movement, just as the populists were. And so the progressives are recycling some of the goals of the populist or the, of the populist movement. But um, when they fail, those movements are also recycled again in the New Deal, as we shall see, right? So to begin with, we need to talk about what is an, uh, it's an election in American history. There are certain elections that we refer to as watershed elections in which um, the, the, the course of the nation is put, uh, the trajectory of the nation is put before the American public, and they have a chance to vote on it, right? So previously, we discussed uh, the 1866 election. Uh, in Reconstruction. That is a watershed election, even though it's not a presidential election year. It's put before the American public, what way are we going to do Reconstruction? And the American public votes overwhelmingly for the more radical approach uh, or congressional legislation or re Reconstruction. 1896 is another watershed election. It's an election where there's two really divergent ways of um, setting the pathway for the nation. One is the, uh, it's a populist position. William Jennings Bryan is the populist candidate who's also uh, validated and nominated by the Democratic Party to be the Democratic candidate. So Bryan is uh, running as a populist slash uh, Democrat, and he's running on a notion of uh, rural reform. He's, his interest, his promotion are rural concerns, farmers con farmer concerns, in the Midwest and the American South. This is, um, you know, the movement is one that's promoting a return to, as Brian argues, what Jefferson, Jeffersonian America is supposed to be, a uh, small town, uh, rural, um, interest about the rural, protecting farmers. These are things that are motivating uh, Brian and the populist and uh, Democratic Party in this 1896 election. On the other side, there's a Republican running by the name of William McKinley. McKinley is representing uh, business interest, uh, the uh, moneyed interest, uh, urban interest, industry interest, right? So we have uh, two uh, uh, candidates and political parties who are promoting very different things uh, in the 1890 election. So it's a watershed election. Which way are the American public going to go? Well, McKinley wins in 1896 and then wins re-election in 1900, although as we shall see, he does not serve his second term, right? So McKinley wins, which is a victory for business and business interests. This sets the trajectory and uh, McGurr nicely gives us an illustration of the people who are excited about this because he has uh, Chicago bankers forming a conga line celebrating McKinley's victory because they recognize this is a victory for their interests. Right, and so 
McGurr says, this is a good place. Uh, we've had a watershed election. This is setting us up for uh, the early 20th century. It's a good place to take a look at what the United States is like. And what he sees, McGurr, is a divided country. It's a country not too far removed from the American Civil War here in 1896 or 1900, right? So the war ends in 1865. You still have a sizable percentage of people um, who were either participating in the war or have been shaped by the American Civil War. So there's still a large segment of uh, American life and American political life. Uh, so uh, he says this is a, a nation that remains divided by region. Right? So you have the North, the South, and then the Midwest and the West. So there's still a divided country by region. Regional interest or regional pride is still a key component, as, as uh, Kim nicely illustrated in her talk on Tuesday. This is a nation divided by race, right? Uh, there is, and this concept of race, by the way, is not uh, a black, white, uh, uh, or Native American, or uh, uh, solely that. It is that. But it's also the term race is a very uh, flexible uh, term for them. So it refers to um, the Italian race or the Jewish race or uh, Bohemian race or, or the Irish race or the Chinese race, things like this, in which uh, the concept of race is more than just the physical manifestation or color of individuals. It's a nation that's divided by ethnicity. Uh, this, uh, the latter 19th century is a period of massive immigration into this nation in which um, it's uh, accelerating and then dwarfing beyond, or it's ac accelerating beyond and dwarfing the previous uh, movement of migrants to this nation, um, primarily from Northern Europe. Now we're getting a, a Southern Europe and Eastern Europe. Uh, so we're getting an influx of people with different ethnicities speaking different languages and different religions, um, you know, uh, Catholics, Jews, and there's a difference between uh, uh, Italian Catholics and Irish Catholics. You're getting Eastern Orthodox, you're getting different ethnic groups moving into this nation, right? And so this is a nation that's divided by uh, ethnicity as well. Most of all, McGurr says, the greatest divide in this nation is the, uh, the division of class. Right? The nation has different classes, and these different classes have different ideas and different visions. Right? And so he wants to talk about, uh, so we've already talked a little bit about the progressives being the middle class or lower upper class. So I want to talk about some of the other class uh, formation that McGurr is going to refer to. The first is what is called the upper 10. Um, these are the wealthy. Uh, and uh, the, uh, within that upper 10, there are the plutocrats, the super wealthy. First off, the name upper 10 is a misnomer. It's no more than one to 2% of the nation, right? In terms of population. So this is a small segment of the population, but they are the ones who control uh, the vast uh, lion's share of the wealth, right? Some of them are super wealthy, uh, like um, uh, JP Morgan and uh, Andrew Carnegie and, uh, and other super wealthy folks. Um, but in general, it's the wealthy uh, ownership class in this nation. Um, the ownership class in the turn of the 20th century was beginning uh, to manifest uh, different uh, actions than previous wealthy people. One in this nation, pre uh, previous, both because they have a much larger share uh, than they uh, had held before, and also because um, a measure of them are beginning to illustrate their wealth through conspicuous consumption, which is the manifesting your wealth so that other people see how wealthy you are. So you have things uh, such as mansion building, right? And so uh, McGurr gives the example of the Biltmore, which is a 143 or 146 room mansion, uh, which has um, thousands and thousands of acres uh, as part of the property. Uh, so much the the this one individually owned mansion is so large that to, to care for the building and the, green, and the greens of the property, it employs more people to manage at the Biltmore than the agriculture department for the entire nation, right? So this is um, a display of wealth to, to show how much money you have and how much you continue to have. So the wealth generated by the Vanderbilt family. Um, and it's a, it's a he, uh, McGurr used the example of the, the Bradley Martins who are not just having a party, but having an over-the-top party to show 
how wealthy they are, right? To manifest your wealth in the conspicuous display of uh, living large. The thing about these upper 10 uh, or the upper 10 is that even if they didn't create their own wealth, like Carnegie created his own wealth, and even if they are just the people who inherited it, they see their success as a function of individualism, which is how they view the world. They have succeeded through their own individual uh, efforts, uh, and other people should be able to succeed as individuals in the same way, which carries with it the nice explanatory factor that if you don't succeed or you are not succeeding, then there's something wrong with what you're doing, right? So they celebrate individualism. That's how they see the world. They want to deal with folks as individuals, right? This is the upper 10. On the opposite side of this uh, spectrum are the working class. Many of them, not all, but many of them, um, uh, recent ethnic immigrants into the nation who are coming in in desperate circumstances. The, the lot, the life of the working class, which is by far the largest segment of the American public, um, they are mired in poverty. Uh, they are living uh, very close to the edge. Uh, uh, they work extremely hard uh, in very uh, dangerous occupations. Uh, so they are uh, phenomenally overworked. Um, they work 60, 70, 80, maybe more hours a week, for example, McGurr points out. In the steel mills, um, steel mill workers would work seven days a week, 12 hours a day in a steel mill. This is uh, very hard work and it's very dangerous work. Uh, so the working class is uh, continually, they're being ground down just the physical grind of working in repetitive uh, stress injury jobs, working on the factory line, working in dangerous circumstances, working in coal mines, working in steel mills, um, where you could, uh, you could die from a cave-in, from an explosion, from uh, the malfunctioning of a piece of machinery, just the operation of the machinery could kill you. Um, you could also be maimed, right? So you could lose an arm, an eye, a leg, any one of these things could happen. Uh, and the working class is susceptible to them at any time because they're working in very hard, uh, very dangerous circumstances, um, and they are tremendously underpaid, very poorly paid. So much so that um, in some uh, examples at McGurr sites, so working as a meat packer, which is uh, butchering uh, animals um, and uh, uh, preparing the cuts of animal uh, for sale in various sorts of ways, um, this full-time occupation, many hours a week, many more hours a week than 40-hour uh, weeks, um, is insufficient to provide sufficient income for your family. Uh, talking about shoemakers or shoe work, shoemaking workers in factories in Buffalo, they earn um, less than 40% of the amount of money necessary to provide the basic essentials, uh, clothing, roof over your head, and food on the table for a family of four, right? So despite working extraordinarily hard, they cannot provide enough to, to sustain their families on their own. So what does this mean? That everybody in the family works, right? The wife works. Uh, the husband works, the children work, sometimes in industry, side by side with the parents, sometimes on the streets, uh, hustling newspapers, shining shoes, scavenging for things to sell, right? Um, everybody is out trying to uh, generate income to keep the family alive. So in this world, and in addition, whatever they're doing, whatever job they're doing is very limited opportunity to, to move up because of their ethnic or religious and sometimes both status, their opportunity to move into management roles is sharply prescribed, right? These are not jobs that are seen as things that, um, you know, Italians can do, right? So the limited opportunities, there's, there's no chance or almost no chance for advancement, right? So together, all these things are conspiring against it. So the working class for their own survival uh, recognizes that they cannot succeed on their own. If an individual worker goes in to talk to the boss about improving working conditions or negotiating a higher wage, they will be thrown out of the office, right? Because at the gate of the factory or at the plant, 
there are a horde of people competing for those jobs because the, there's a number of people who are trying to land any sort of job because they're in desperate circumstances, which means that the workers have a tenuous hold on their job. They can be hired and fired at any time for any reason, right? The factory could shut down because the, there's, you know, the, the economy has slowed or the, they've made so much product and it's not selling right now that the, the factory could shut down and there'd be no unemployment, there'd be nothing to, got, to safeguard these people. They're living right on the edge. So they recognize that the only way they can su survive is as a collective. Now, the clearest vision of a collective is a union, right? So one worker can't negotiate for improved working condition or, or um, improved uh, pay. But if all the workers come in and say, we need to improve working conditions or we're going to go on strike, then collectively they have some sort of power. This mutualism is more than just unions, although you, this effort to form collective unions is an, an important component. It also takes the form of mutual aid societies. So uh, the workers would scrape a, a few pennies out of their paycheck and put it into a pool so that if anybody in this uh, group was, uh, you know, if they were uh, uh, accidentally murdered or killed uh, or maimed or something happened to them, that there'd be some kind of fun to care for the widow and orphans or to provide funeral expenses or something. Um, collectively, uh, we can uh, help care for one another. So uh, from this little pool of money that the workers would collect, they would use it maybe to buy coal for somebody or something, right? And these collective and mutual actions oftentimes were uh, formed through religious identity or ethnic identity. There'd be uh, Italian uh, Catholics who would uh, help uh, raise money for other Italian Catholics. So their vision is that we can only survive and succeed as a group, right? It's in complete opposition to the way the upper 10 see the world who see that individualism is the way things uh, should be done. So you have these tensions baked into it because of the living situation of these two different groups. McGurr then talks about a sort of hybrid group and, and uh, here he's talking about farmers, right? So the, the farmers historically have this notion of individualism. A farmer will decide what crop he will plant. I will plant corn or soybean or whatever. So they consider themselves individuals because they're running their own properties, making their own decisions when to plant, what to plant, when to harvest. These type of things are individual des decisions and it's something that is prized as McGurk talks about. But increasingly by the turn of the 20th century, these farmers have been swept up into a much larger system because they're not farmers who are growing for their own to sustain themselves and their family and then maybe selling the excess to the market, right? Instead, these are, they're completely enmeshed in the market. They're growing product to sell in the market, wheat or corn on the large scale or tobacco or cotton. Uh, and further, they're doing so not just in a regional area, they're on a global market. Uh, and so in order to compete on this global market, they have to expand their property. So they have to take loans to buy more property. Because their property is so large, they have to buy new equipment, expensive tractors or combines or some such thing. They have to hire workers uh, at you know seasonal times to harvest or plant or something. So they're increasingly caught up in this market system uh, in which they're just one small piece. And so as an individual, they begin uh, to find that they uh, need to act collectively, right? So farmers are a hybrid because in one way they're acting as individuals and viewing themselves as individuals, but they also see themselves as part of a collective. And so you see farmers forming uh, the Grange, which are, are collective unions for uh, farmers or co-op systems where they're uh, going in to buy things uh, as a group, right? So combined, uh, farmers are kind of a mix of both. So what is going on that McGurr sees is that this nation is increasingly afflicted with simmering class conflict. Conflict between um, uh, classes in this nation who have completely different ways of seeing the way the world should work. Uh, and the uh, progressives are alarmed about this because the this, this clash between the, the classes is in becoming increasingly violent and as they see it, destroying the nation, right? Uh, okay. Oops, guessed wrong again. Okay, 
So we need to uh, situate these, this story into sort of a larger movement, right? So this is the middle class we're talking about, the progressives. And this is during a particular time frame known as the Victorian era. Um, Victorian era is named for Queen Victoria in England. Um, and it's sort of the ideal, I, idealized version of how the nation should operate, right? In this Victorian world, as it's seen, uh, there is the, the husband who's the breadwinner who goes out and makes the money. The wife stays home and keeps the house uh, and cares for the children. And they operate in uh, different worlds, as they refer to it as different spheres. There's the um, private and public sphere, right? But for people within this system, um, a, a Victorian is a very sober and demure individual. They're hardworking, they're thrifty. Uh, they're, this notion of who the Victorians apply to is old stock, white collar Americans, uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants would be, uh, you know, sort of seen as this class. So they have certain public roles that you should, that should be maintained. So a man out in the public world acts, um, he has responsibility uh, to act in a certain fashion, proper fashion as they see, right? These spheres, this world is broken up into the private and public sphere. The public sphere is the male sphere. The man goes out into the world uh, and uh, faces the hurly-burly to uh, generate uh, the money as the breadwinner, right? It's a, a dirty, dangerous world outside, right? And so when they return home, they return to the private sphere, which is supposed to be their sanctuary. And it's the sanctuary that is maintained by women, the private sphere, because in this Victorian idea, um, women's role is to be in the household, right? Raising the children, educating the children, serving as the safe abode uh, for the husband to return to, right? So this public and private world, it's supposed to be bifurcated. Men have public roles, which include political roles. That's part of the public world. Women do not, right? Their role is in the household, right? So this is sort of, you know, uh, an oversimplified vision of what the Victorian era is supposed to be about. This world or this vision is under assault because the nation is undergoing enormous changes, uh, rapid uh, changes, right? Uh, part, of this, uh, part of this change is because women were rejecting this, you know, artificial uh, walled off world of the private sphere and we're seeking to assert their public rights. So although they're relatively small in number, the suffrage moving, movement is women's, women moving into the public sphere, uh, agitating, uh, demonstrating for their right to vote because they uh, feel that this is something that they are entitled to as Americans as well, and that they don't wanna be shoved back into the private world. They want to go out into the public world and assert their own individual, individual ideas and to engage in things like voting, right? So uh, this suffrage movement, although it's small, it's a very public movement and, and it's part of this movement in general of, moving, of women moving out of um, the private sphere into the public world, wanting to escape this sort of uh, cage of being stuck into this uh, role in the Victor Victorian era, they wanna go out, right? Um, part of the things that are accelerating this process is that the Gilded Age is the catalyst. Um, this nation is rapidly transforming uh, into um, an industrial nation uh, in which um, it's not only an industrial nation, it's a nation in which the makeup of the nation is rapidly changing because of very large uh, immigration, an immigration of folks with different ethnicities, different languages, different cultural backgrounds, different religions. They're coming into this nation uh, and they're transforming the nation. Um, the way that work is being done is being transformed. It's now on a much larger scale. Um, the workers are part of, in a sense, the type of machinery. So instead of the dignity of free labor, you're just another worker on the line, right? So the Gilded Age is transferring all these things. This is uh, occurring and is causing conflict and tension. Uh, and it's increasing class conflict because the workers 
with their mutual ideas and their recognition that as individuals, uh, they are powerless in this system, are working collectively uh, and thinking of themselves uh, as classes. And, the, and this increasing class conflict is most visibly seen and most, um, or amongst the most violently, um, actually segregation may be uh, of equal violence. Uh, I don't know how to equate them, but uh, this class conflict is increasingly violent and it comes in the form of strikes. The strikes of workers are becoming uh, more bitter, uh, more violent, the repression uh, and the breaking of strikes by the ownership class is becoming increasingly violent um, and the, the nation is roiled by these uh, increasing conflict between the classes, um, most clearly manifested in strikes, right? So the, the middle class is looking on with these transformations with alarm. And what they see is the actions of these other folks are destroying the nation. And so they say somebody needs to save the nation, right? This nation is being torn apart by these various types of uh, trans transformations. Um, somebody needs to uh, serve as a stabilizing force and they find that somebody in their own mirrors. The people who need to save the nation as they see it is the white middle class. So the white middle class are the folks who make up uh, the lion's share of this progressive movement. And uh, the progressives are action people. And we'll talk uh, next time about action people in, uh, in a variety of realms. But they're people who want to do things. It's not, it's not enough just to identify the problem. They want to provide a solution. And this solution comes in a variety of forms. One form of the progressive movement is a recognition that um, people in urban areas are in need of help, that they're being poorly treated and living in terrible conditions, right? And so uh, one part of the progressive movement is a movement known as social gospel, right? Uh, and uh, McGurr talks at some measure of detail about Jane Addams, right? Who is somebody who's um, uh, a person motivated by these ideas and sets off and creates a pathway which is, is part of the progressive movement. <clears throat> the idea of the social gospel is that you do good for yourself in a spiritual sense. You do good spiritually by helping other people in a very real sense, right? So the progressives see that there's a need for somebody to help these people in ethnic uh, 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 ghettos and ethnic uh, groupings, right? And they see that as somebody, they, they are the ones to do it. And this movement takes the form, uh, uh, the most clear manifestation of this is something known as a settlement house. And I'm going to talk about how the settlement house evolved in a second, but first I'll tell you how it lays out. Settlement houses are houses that are um, purchased by uh, progressives, motivated by social gospel, uh, the upper middle class and uh, and the lower upper class, they buy houses in ethnic ghettos, right? And this is not about, here's a place where you come get help and I'm gonna make, write a check and donate money to it. The settlement houses, the progressives themselves move into the house and live in the ethnic ghetto and then try and provide service to the people in that neighborhood to help them, right? <clears throat> They're motivated by high-minded ideals. Uh, they want to help these people improve their lives, right? Uh, I'll talk about how they form it in just a second. Um, this social gospel movement is not exclusively, but it's a primarily female-led effort. Um, there are male uh, social gospelers who live in, the, in settlement houses and take these roles, but uh, the settlement houses are overrepresented with women, uh, women from uh, upper class and lower and upper middle class uh, households who have found purpose and meaning in their life, like Jane Adams has, in helping other people. It helps them spiritually to help these people in a real fashion. Initially, what the settlement house movement identified as the yawning need that these people need uh, needed was they thought that these people needed exposure to culture to uplift their lives. So initially, settlement houses are focusing on, you know, uh, uh, putting on Shakespeare or, or having a lecture by uh, a, a Harvard professor to come and talk about some subject 
or serve as a, you know, a, I don't know, a type of book club, right? Um, to elevate people culturally. They thought this is what is needed in these ethnic ghettos. But pretty quickly they realized being situated in these ethnic ghettos, living with these people, that these people uh, who lived in these ghettos had real needs beyond just cultural needs, right? Uh, so um, the settlement house movement pretty quickly shifted to providing support for people. So uh, the, the progressive social gospelers thought it was, you know, children should be in school and not on the streets, but they recognized that, they came to pretty quickly recognize that the reason that children are on the streets, partly it's about generating money, but also it's partly about the mother has to work in the factory as well. So there's nowhere for the kids to be, right? And so the settlement houses said, well, we'll provide sort of daycare or schooling or, or some sort of support system for that. Um, they recognized, they came to recognize, they, they were opposed and agitated against, you know, child labor. Why are these children working instead of being in school? And they recognized they're working because the family needs every penny they can scrape up. So there's challenges and they recognize that at the root of many of the problems they see uh, afflicting these ethnic groupings are economic problems. And so they begin to um, uh, develop uh, an approach that says we need to provide more for these uh, ethnic groups uh, to aid them, right? The, the method they begin to recognize is necessary, right, is something uh, that is a relatively new concept, which we're going to talk about in greater detail going forward. But what they recognize is that it's not enough for the social gospel movement and the settlement houses to be doing things, that the scale of this problem requires another source of support and action. And that source of support and action must come from the government, the state, right? So the progressives are agitating for an activist state. This is not how the nation had viewed the role of government before. Government was seen as having a very minimal role, uh, but what the progressives recognized is big business and economic problems are exacerbating uh, the difficult conditions for these people uh, in the ethnic ghettos, in these desperate circumstances. Somebody needs to oversee big business. You can write nasty letters, uh, you can, uh, uh, you know, say to the newspaper that the, the owners are not treating their workers well. That's not going to get things changed. What you need is something big enough and powerful enough uh, to have some sort of oversight role uh, protecting the workers uh, in these factories. And the progressives and the social gospel movement recognize it's the state. So they're uh, advertising, adver uh, supporting and endorsing and pushing for an activist state to take these roles on. Now, partly they say we need this activist state because they recognize without somebody providing aid uh, and looking out for the interests of the workers, then they would be attracted and drawn to more radical action. Radical action like forming a union or maybe being socialist, right? Uh, so, the, the progressives, uh, they're concerned about the ethnic groupings uh, and, the, and the poor conditions and treatment that they are uh, uh, living and laboring under, and they want to change that, but they don't want the workers to take radical action. They also fear this idea of radical action, and they're opposed to the idea, this uh, notion of a class identity, that is, you know, if you're a worker and part of the working class, then you're no longer an individual, you're a privileging class, which the progressives are opposed to, right? So they're recognizing that there's a problem, then there's, there's a need, and to forestall what they see as radical action, they want the state to step in. All right, so uh, that's the social gospel movement. They're motivated by um, uh, very high ideals. Um, they're also, unfortunately, a product of their time, so they tend uh, to view things paternalistically, we know better, right? And they also have, uh, tend to have some chauvinism, right? We're promoting the best way to do it, and it's the American way. The old way you're doing things, the old country ways are backwards, they're wrong. Uh, you should adopt the good modern American ways. And so 
um, they have this notion of superiority, uh, both in the sense that we know best what's, what's best for you, uh, but also that the way we do stuff is better. So stop doing what you're doing and start doing what Americans doing because that's the best way to do it. All right, so uh, that's uh, the first part of uh, McGurr's book. Uh, we'll pick up uh, with the, the, the next chapters going forward and I will post them uh, in the coming days.